I call the members to order and the first item on our agenda this afternoon is questions to the First Minister and the first question, Angela Burns. Uh, good afternoon, First Minister. What plans do you have to support the pharmaceutical industry in Wales? Well, our plans are to be found, of course, in the national strategy. We have a strong presence of companies providing pharmaceutical services and we have a proven track record of supporting clinical trials and pharmaceutical services here in Wales and that will continue in the future. Um, in, indeed, you do have a proven track record on that, and I really welcome it. Um, I recognise that your government has attracted considerable investment into the whole life sciences business, which in our country employs some 11,000 people. I am very concerned, though, about what might happen as a consequence of Brexit, and I wondered what... Dis Allow the member to ask her question, please. Angela Burns. And I just wondered, what discussion has your government had with its Westminster counterparts around the future of regulatory frameworks post-Brexit? And are you intending to feed into the House of Commons Health Select Committee inquiry, which is looking at post-Brexit arrangements to guarantee the supply of medicines, devices and products, and particularly in relation to our ability for NICE and the All Wales Medicine Strategy Group? We are exemplars throughout Europe and the EMA countries, and if we are no longer able to hook into the European uh, exemplars, then we might lose some of that uh, money that's coming currently into Wales for some of these pilots. And I'd just like to know what you're going to be able to do. Well, about. the member is, is very, uh, very much correct to, uh, to raise that issue. This, amongst many other issues, uh, is not yet um, worked through in terms of clarity as far as the public are, are concerned. It makes no sense at all for the UK to have a different regulatory regime to the rest of Europe. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we have urged on the uh, UK government is that there is no need for divergence when none is required. Uh, why would we have a separate system that is different from everyone else, uh, in effect? So uh, I very much agree with her comments. Uh, we have made the point on this and in other areas, such as chemicals, for example, the REACH directive, uh, how, what application will that have after we leave the, uh, the EU? Does that mean that chemicals will be less regulated in the UK? Uh, and all these issues will form part and continue to form part of the discussions we're having with the UK government. Rhiannon Passmore. Uh, Dion Howard. <coughs> First Minister Andrew Evans, upon his appointment as Wales Chief Pharmaceutical Officer, stated, and I quote, pharmacists in Wales are taking a central role in the Welsh Government's drive to provide patients with high quality care promptly and closer to home. And I look forward to working with pharmacists and other health and care professions, building on the significant improvements we have already made. Can the First Minister reconfirm that the pharmaceutical industry in Wales is key to the Welsh Government's drive for equipping the Welsh National Health Service? to serve its patients in the years ahead and also update us on how that work is progressing. Absolutely. We support the pharmaceutical industry, for example, through uh, life sciences, uh, the Life Sciences Investment Fund. Uh, that's made 11 investments into nine uh, companies, including those that serve the pharmaceutical industry. It's attracted considerable levels of co-investment. Uh, a life sciences hub has been delivered to provide a physical focus for the sector in Wales. Uh, together with a company to implement and deliver key elements of uh, policy. And that hub is one of the uh, cornerstones of uh, what the uh, sector will need to build on in uh, the future. We're working on a development of a brand with international reputation. Uh, our trade missions, for example, to Medica have consistently been the largest single trade event for Wales over the past three years. And of course, we see the continued growth of uh, Bio Wales, which is the signature event for the sector, something that I attended uh, a few years ago. And it's the vehicle for Welsh life sciences companies and academic departments to exhibit their expertise to an international audience. So the work is being done not just in terms of supporting pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies who are here, but ensuring them to have a pipeline of skills for the future. Question die, Vicky. Question two, Vicky Howell. Yes. What are the Welsh Government's priorities for the allocation of funding <coughs> under the 21st Century Schools programme during this Assembly term? Well, the programme seeks to target investment uh, at those schools and colleges in the poorest condition and to deliver sustainable, cost-effective uh, buildings. And, of course, we are seeking to uh, take forward the uh, programme over the next few years, building uh, on the success of the programme uh, over the last few years. 
Uh, First Minister, I'm very proud that my constituency of Cannon Valley has benefited to the tune of over £100 million in new and improved educational facilities under the 21st Century Schools programme, which I understand is more than any other constituency in Wales. Um, and I know that you attended the official opening just the other week of the new £22 million um, colleague at Camoeth uh, campus in Aberdeen. Um, evidence that we took recently in the Economy Committee from colleague at Cymru suggests, however, that the FE sector isn't as successful as perhaps it could be in tapping into that funding. So in terms of the important role further education has in providing choice to learners and in boosting skills, how is the Welsh Government engaging with the sector so that it can maximise the benefits of the programme? Well, it's right to say that over £120 million has been allocated for FE produce during the Band A uh, programme. We've seen the uh, results of that. Uh, over £10.6 million of capital funding has been provided to FE institutions to upgrade their IT and skills equipment. Over the next wave of investment, Band B, we're working with FE colleges to develop their investment plans for uh, this next wave uh, for, so that we can understand where, of course, investment should uh, come. And we encourage uh, FE uh, institutions to come forward uh, with investment projects that will uh, benefit them as institutions. Nick Ramsey. The offer with uh, First Minister, the 21st Century Schools Programme has pr probably been one of the most popular Welsh Government policies uh, over recent years, due in no small part to the role played by progressive, forward-looking local authorities like Conservative-led Monmouthshire. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Monmouth Comprehensive School is currently being rebuilt and, when complete, will have state-of-the-art facilities, including modern interactive classrooms and IT. It's not just for pupils, it's for the whole town. How is the Welsh Government working with local authorities to help develop new schools like this as community hubs and to help target funding at local projects that will tie in with uh, developments like this? Well, I admire his, uh, his craft in, uh, in turning this into a, a question to congratulate uh, Munmershire LEA. Of course, uh, we welcome the fact that uh, Munmershire and other LEAs, all LEAs in Wales, have been able to benefit from the School Improvement Programme. I'd remind you, of course, uh, that his party in England has no such programme. Uh, and in, in that case, in Munmershire, of course, no new school would be built there or indeed anywhere else in Wales. £1.4 billion has been, was committed over the five year period, is being committed over the five year period up to uh, 2019. That means funding has been approved for 151 projects in Band A of our programme, exceeding our target. 83 of those projects are complete, 45 under construction. That is a significant investment in the future of Welsh young people and Welsh education, which only a Welsh Labour government could deliver. Sir Griffith. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Clywydd. What steps is the government taking to ensure that the funding available within the 21st century schools budget is used to enhance Welsh medium education? Because we know, for example, that there is a higher rate of support for faith school, it's 85%, as I understand it, rather than 50% for schools more generally. Would you be considering some similar methods to that to ensure that you reach your target in terms of a million well speakers? The important point is that local authorities are able, for example, to produce the strategic Welsh medium education plans in their areas, and they haven't been doing so consistently, I have to say, and so that we should use those WESPs to target those areas where we should have more new Welsh schools. The tendency over the years is that the new schools have tended to be English schools and the Welsh schools have then been established in their former uh, older buildings and that is not how it should be in the long run. So this starts with the WESPs, namely the strategic plans. We must ensure that every WESP in Wales is robust and does ensure that it supports us in building up to a million Welsh speakers by 2050. Questions from the party leaders, leader of the UKIP group, Neil Hamilton. Uh, the Welsh Government and indeed the Labour Party generally have been very critical of zero hours contracts and also firms like Uber who <coughs> they say use their terms and conditions to exploit workers. Well, Aren't supply teachers in Wales often in the same situation? There's a case that was quoted on the BBC website this week of Angela Sandals, who's a qualified primary school teacher, but for the last six years has also been a foster parent and so has been a supply teacher. 
She says that uh, after deductions from the agency that she works for, she could be paid around the minimum wage, and some supply teachers are turned to pizza delivery to make ends meet, and supply teachers are voting with their feet and leaving and looking for alternative employment. Does the First Minister think that this is an acceptable situation? Oh, but then this isn't devolved yet. Uh, this is something that will come to us uh, next year. We have a supply teaching working group that is looking at ways to uh, boost uh, the employment prospects and indeed income of uh, supply teachers, uh, and that is exactly what we plan to take forward. As the First Minister will probably know, supply teachers in England, England <coughs> on average paid about £130 a day, but in Cardiff that's on average £90 to £95 pounds a day, and in West Wales it's as low as £80 pounds a day. Agencies are charging schools above the rate for teachers on main scale one to four, and teachers with 20 years' experience therefore can be paid less than a newly qualified teacher who's permanently employed. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary for the Economy and Infrastructure said recently in relation to Uber that people should be able to rely on a fair wage regardless of their line of work, and I don't think there'll be any member in this place that would disagree with that. Well, it is a matter for the school, of course, because schools employ these supply teachers. In order to uh, change to a situation where there is complete consistency in that regard, then LMS would have to be removed from schools. In Northern Ireland, where there is no LMS, uh, there's far greater consistency in terms of supply uh, teachers' pay. Now, this is an issue that hasn't yet been devolved to us. Uh, the changing of the system away from LMS would require primary legislation, inevitably, and these are issues which uh, members will have to consider over the next few months. But in the meantime, uh, what we intend to do is using the, uh, the, the, the working group we've put together to improve the conditions of supply teachers, while at the same time considering the best uh, outcome in the longer term. Of course, I mean, schools are, uh, come under the uh, uh, regulation of local authorities and responsibility of local authorities at any rate and, and of course the Welsh Government is responsible for funding those schools and has great persuasive authority even, even if it doesn't have the legal authority amongst uh, other deficiencies of the current situation for lots of agency teachers they've got no access to, to teachers pension scheme and often their holiday pay arrangements mean that part of the wages that they are paid for doing their job are held back to them to be handed out during the holidays as though that were holiday pay on top of their normal pay which is quite wrong the effect has been that for public sector <coughs> workers in general who've had a pay cap for the last 10 years, supply teachers have done a good deal worse, and many of them have had a pay cut in effect of up to 40% in the last 15 years. Uh, and also, many of these supply contracts also have a clause in them, which you have to accept or else you don't get the job, saying, I accept I will not be paid according to agency worker regulations. Is the Welsh Government going to do something specific about these abuses? These are issues that are being considered in advance of the devolution of uh, paying conditions. Uh, we know that schools are, he said that the local authorities are responsible, but schools are responsible for employing their supply teachers. Uh, and of course, uh, if schools wished to uh, employ supply teachers in a different way rather than go through agencies, then that would be open uh, to them. But with this being devolved in the very near future, this now gives us the opportunity to deal with the issues which I recognise, because I've had constituents come in to, 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 ex to explain this to me as well, to deal with these issues in a way that wasn't possible before in the absence of, of devolution. I come really to Leonwood. The first Secretary of State, Damien Green, said yesterday in terms of the EU withdrawal bill, and I quote, talk of a power grab is behind us. Do you agree with him? We are not yet in a position where, well, I'm not yet in a position where I could recommend to this Assembly that we should support the withdrawal bill. I did have a meeting with him and with the Secretary of State for Wales. I think it's fair to say there was a better understanding of our determination not to support the bill unless the power grab is addressed. Uh, and I, I think it's fair to say that, that um, it was a better meeting than uh, previous uh, meetings. Perhaps the, 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 the arithmetic in the House of Commons is, has been realised now by the UK government. But uh, we're not in a position yet where we can recommend that the bill should be supported. We now need to see uh, action by the UK government to, to make sure that power grab is, uh, is removed. Well, it's encouraging to hear that you had a, a more positive meeting, but Plaid Cymru still sees that there is a, a risk of a power grab in this bill. Clause 11 <coughs> of the bill places restrictions on the devolved administrations on competence relating to EU law. 
although that's not the only part of the bill uh, where we've got concerns, as you will be uh, aware. The meeting between Theresa May and Jean-Claude Juncker last night was of in crucial importance to Wales. Even more than the withdrawal bill uh, that I've mentioned, the terms of EU exit on trade is vital in terms of Welsh jobs. Last night, though, there was no breakthrough. breakthrough. The admission that talks need to accelerate is, in my view, a sign of their failure so far. Will you acknowledge that leaving the EU without a deal is a real prospect? And if that does happen, that it would be bad news for Welsh jobs, for Welsh farming and for Welsh trade? It's an exceptionally worrying prospect. As I've said before, uh, no deal is the worst deal. Uh, to leave in chaotic uh, circumstances will be bad for, for everybody. The concern that I have is that insufficient progress is made by March 2019 so that uh, no deal becomes the default position. Uh, that is something that, that she and I are in exactly the same position in terms of saying that, that we would oppose that. It's hugely important that there is a deal on the table that, that enables Welsh businesses to be able to access the single market on the same terms as now. But if you agree, First Minister, that leaving the EU without a deal is a real prospect and that it would be indeed bad news uh, for Wales, then the next obvious question that I have for you is what it is you're going to do about it. How is the Welsh Government preparing for every possible Brexit scenario? You know that yesterday the Farmers' Union of Wales indicated its support for staying in the single market and the customs union, and they said that the evidence supporting that position was incontrovertible. It's only a matter of time now before other sectors follow them. Your government said in July that businesses were more focused on the short term because there was so much uncertainty around that final deal. You could also not provide data as to how many businesses your government had been in contact with uh, regarding Brexit support. Can you now outline the concrete steps you were taking to prepare the Welsh economy for all possible Brexit scenarios? And will you accept that it is your duty to ensure that the Welsh economy does not sleepwalk into a dangerous economic crisis. We have an EU exit uh, working group that is uh, working on different scenarios, but I have to say that no deal, there is no mitigation for no deal. There's nothing literally we can do uh, in the short term if we find there's no, there's no deal. In the longer term, it's possible to look for, for new markets, but in, in the timescale we're talking about, it's, it's, it's impossible. If we look at farming, particularly sheep and dairy farming is in a less vulnerable position, but sheep farming particularly. Sheep farmers face a, a triple whammy, in effect, of A, finding that, that their, uh, what they produce is now 40% more expensive in their main target market, B, uh, seeing a question mark over their subsidies post-2021, and C, a potential free trade deal with another country with a large sheep meat industry, uh, that, like New Zealand, for example, that is then allowed to come into the UK without any, any restriction at all. In those circumstances, no matter how much subsidy can be made available for farmers, much of what they produce will not be sellable. And that's why it's hugely important that our sheep farmers, our manufacturers, are able to access the single market in the same way as they do now. It's perfectly possible to leave the EU and yet still have access to the single market. Norway have done it. Norway is an EEA country. Nigel Farage himself was using Norway as an example of what we could be. And in that sense, if in little else, he's right. Because the last thing we want to see is uh, no deal. Because there's no amount of preparation can prepare the Welsh economy for what is bound to be bad news if we cannot access them uh, properly, the market where we sell only two-thirds of our goods. Leader of the Opposition, Andrew Arty Davis. Officer, uh, First Minister, why doesn't the uh, Welsh Government use economic intelligence and, impu and, importantly, input and output tables when creating policy and deciding where to support the Welsh economy? Well, we do. I have to say you do not use economic intelligence or input or output uh, tables. I have not to find an academic, a businessman or woman. Um, there is no one who can support what you just said, First Minister. Uh, if you look at the Scottish model, they have a dedicated unit at Strathclyde University, which they established some years ago, that informs Scottish Government policy about the output of the economy, about job creation, and above all, about the support that the economy in Scotland needs. I am concerned at the flippancy of your answer, in particular when you look at the challenges that the Welsh economy faces. Will, will you reconsider 
the answers you've just given because I can tell you that what the Welsh economy needs when developing new policy and support for the Welsh economy, it needs sound data, good information and an understanding of how the economy works. And I point again to your assertion that you say yes when in fact, compared to what Scotland do with a dedicated unit at Strathclyde University, you have nothing of a comparable nature. Well, first of all, the worst thing for the Welsh economy would be a chaotic Brexit. And that's, the, that's the worst thing of all. We do have a chief economist who advises uh, government. We consult with businesses through bodies such as the Council for uh, Economic uh, Development. And in that way, we have the intelligence, the intelligence that we need to take the Welsh economy forward. But he speaks as if we have nothing uh, in terms of advice. We do have a chief economist and a department who provides us with that advice. First Minister, economic intelligence and input and output tables are well understood in the development of public policy, the length and breadth of governments around the world. It was a relatively straightforward question I opened this series of questions with. When you look at the challenges that the Welsh economy faces, putting Brexit to one side on automation, for example, which one of your backbenchers has highlighted time and time again in this chamber, by 2025, we will lose 15% of the jobs in the workplace as we understand them today. By 2035, we are set to lose 35% of the jobs in the workplace as we understand them today. 2035 is only 18 years away. You have no ability, and I reiterate this, you have no ability to use the tools that other governments use, the length and breadth of the world, and in particular in devolved contexts such as Scotland. Will you commission a unit here in Wales to support the development of public policy on input and output policy for economic intelligence for us. Well, again, as I said, we have, we have the, 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 the bodies that have been set up to work with industry. Industry Wales is another example of that. We have a chief economist and other economists who can support what we are doing. We also have the Public Policy Institute for Wales, whose job it is, is to look at issues as they arise and provide us with advice. We do have that academic input into uh, policy making. Um, he seems to give the impression that somehow we have no economic data at all or advice uh, that advises us on what we, uh, we, we need to do. That is not correct. Uh, and as we see from the fact that unemployment is uh, at a low level and the FDI is at a very high level, that the information we're getting is clearly right as far as the decisions we're taking are concerned. Question three. Question three, Adam Price. Has the Welsh Government specified uh, the provision of electric trains between Cardiff and Swansea in its invitation to tender for the Wales and Borders franchise? Well, as a result of the UK Government announcement in July that it wouldn't electrify to Swansea, but as for our rail services, we will be unable to provide and operate electric trains between Cardiff and Swansea in any event. The, the original business case in, in 2012, there was the, uh, the, the, the basis for the uh, electrification uh, decision, uh, included four electric trains per hour between Swansea and Cardiff, including uh, local services, as I understand. Now, now, had the Welsh Government inserted a requirement for electric local services in the detailed franchise <coughs> specification as per this original business case, the Department of Transport would have, would have found it nigh on impossible to, uh, to, to re, uh, reject electrification. So hasn't the, the Welsh Government missed an opportunity here? What are you going to now do, given the situation that we're, we're now in, to rectify the fact that uh, uh, Swansea is not going to have the electrification they was promised? Well, the, the blame for the failure to electrify is at the feet of the UK Government. Uh, it was they who made the promise uh, to electrify the line. It was they who withdrew or reneged on that promise uh, not to electrify that line. We know that the cost is about 500 million to electrify between, between Cardiff and Swansea. We want to make sure, uh, as our plans have shown, whether it's via the Metro or whether it's via the, uh, more widely through the franchise, that we want to run better trains more frequently on our railway lines. I don't think it would have been a blind difference, to be honest, if we'd specified it uh, in, the, in the franchise, they would still have withdrawn their funding. Mike Hedges. Thank you, Chloe. I would like to stress the importance of the electrification of the main London Swansea rail line in going through Bridgenda, First Minister. Uh, I think it's incredibly important. The message it sends out to potential investors about how important you think an area is when you do stop the, stop the electrification uh, 40 miles away, I think is uh, ser uh, seriously uh, disadvantageous to those of us who live west of Cardiff. Will the First Minister continue to support the electrification of the railway line from Cardiff to Swansea? Yes, is the simple answer. Uh, but of course, this is not a devolved uh, area. The budget is held by the UK government. It's the UK government to make good 
on its promise. I, I share his concern that in time, uh, that uh, as we see uh, different trains being introduced over the years, uh, that the fact there's no electrification will mean in time that the intercity trains will stop in Cardiff because there is no mode of uh, traction able to take them further west. Yes, we do have bimodal trains now. Yesterday's launch was perhaps not the most suspicious uh, launch as the first train broke down. Uh, the second one seemed to be uh, cascading water over people because of a fault with the air conditioning uh, system. Uh, but you know, we hope those, those issues clearly are resolved for the good of the, uh, the economy of South Wales. But a promise was made to the people of Wales. That promise was broken by the same party. Uh, what worth now is any promise from any Conservative government after breaking a promise that was so publicly made? Will the First Minister update members on, whenever, on whether sorry, any progress has been made on the UK Tory government's devolving all the powers required to the Welsh Government to ensure a successful tendering process of the new Wales and Border franchise? The people of Wales want to see the First Minister of Wales and the Cabinet Secretary for Economy and Infrastructure fully in charge of this process without any interference from Chris Grayling, Alan Keynes and their officials. And yesterday, these two boarded a state-of-the-art new train that left 25 minutes late owing to technical issues, and it was further delayed en route. Water leaked from air conditioning units and commuters were forced to stand with the air conditioning units turned off. Can the First Minister do all in his powers to keep the calamity Conservatives away from decision making on the Welsh Railway networks? I think that's, that's best. I mean, uh, with, with, regard to the, uh, with regard to the franchise uh, uh, agreement, uh, progress is being made in that regard now. It was, uh, there were some uh, blockages that needed to be cleared. They, they, have, been, uh, they have been cleared. But the sad thing is that the UK government refuses to allow the people of Wales any kind of control over, over their own rail network. We don't even have the power to direct network rail. The Scots do. We can direct network rail. And the reality is that only 1.5% of rail investment comes to Wales. Now, that share should be 6%, 6.2% based on, on, on a Barnet share. We get 1.5%. It's ludicrous. Uh, on top of that, of course, we know the Scots are able to look at a, a, uh, an arm's length not-for-profit public sector body as a, a, an option for running their rail railways. We were specifically forbidden from doing it, uh, presumably on the basis that we would in some way contaminate uh, English stations with strange notions about um, not-for-profit, well-run railway services. But uh, that is the difference uh, between the treatment of, of Wales and England and Scotland by this Conservative government. When it comes to rail, we get no fair play at all. We get broken promises. But we, as a Welsh government, make up for their deficiencies. Question, Question four, Mark Ishwood. How is the Welsh government supporting the recruitment of police officers in Wales? Well, policing is not devolved to the Welsh government, so we have no involvement in the recruitment of police officers. That is a matter for the Home Office. Thank you, and that's why I chose the word supporting. Three weeks ago, uh, I raised concern with you expressed by the four police and crime commissioners and four chief constables in Wales uh, that their inability to access the £2 million paid the apprenticeship levy could result in uh, fewer uh, police officers <coughs> and potential recruits choosing to sign up for English forces instead. In your response, you confirmed that, of course, you'd received a share of the apprenticeship levy in Welsh Government, but, quote, cannot in good faith pay towards apprenticeship schemes that sit in non-devolved areas. Uh, in reality, in the 2017-18 uh, Welsh Government budget, you said you would give half a million to police and crime commissioners to ensure they are not disadvantaged as a result of the apprenticeship levy. You actually received £128 million, which covers the £90 million removed from the Barnet uh, block. It covers the £30 million paid into the levy by Welsh public sector employers and left uh, an £8 million uh, uh, top-up uh, above that level. What engagement are you therefore having as a government with the police and crime commissioners and chief constables over this very serious matter to ensure that you give the maximum support you can uh, where you're able to uh, in this area? Well, we, we meet regularly with the, uh, the regular ministerial meetings, in fact, to discuss finance and other matters. Uh, bear in mind, of course, that as a government, we uh, supported and continue to support 500 uh, PCSOs across Wales, an issue that is not devolved, but it's an issue of community safety that uh, we want to take seriously and has had a, a positive impact on so many communities. But I have to say to the member, he cannot stand there and say that policing shouldn't be devolved and then say we should spend money on a service that isn't devolved. If policing had been devolved, this would be a matter for us. We argue it should be devolved like every other emergency service. It is a matter, it is a matter for the UK government to fund 
uh, the, the training of police officers. Otherwise, give us the budget, give us devolution, and we'll do it. David Rowlands. Reactionary first. Uh, uh, first Minister, whilst the recruitment of uh, police officers must remain a high priority, we cannot overlook the hugely important factor of retention. 91% of Gwent officers say there is not enough manpower, 80% say they have unachievable uh, deadlines, and 76% say they cannot meet uh, demands. All of this, of course, leads to low morale and uh, disillusionment with the job. Can the First Minister outline the Welsh Government's strategy to combat these stresses and thus uh, make retention more sustainable? Well, again, I have to remind the Member that these are not matters of the Welsh Government. They are matters of the UK Government. I don't disagree with what he said. Actually, it's a sign of austerity that the police service is under so much uh, pressure, uh, but that is the responsibility of the UK Government. We made it very clear that we would wish to see the devolution of policing with the appropriate budget transfer, and we would do a better job for our police officers. Priyanon Passmore. First Minister, the Tory UK Government recently made a derisory deviation from their ideological obsession with austerity when they announced police officers would get a 1% bonus funded from existing budgets. Steve White, Chairman of the Police Federation of England and Wales, said that this announcement would leave many officers angry and deflated. We were not greedy in what we asked for, Mr White added. Officers have been taking home about 15% less than they were seven years ago. The Federation has asked for a mere 2.8% increase to basic pay. Would the First Minister call on the Tory UK Government and their supporters in this very chamber to pay police officers a decent salary so as to ensure new recruits are not turned off serving their communities as police officers. Uh, we've, we've heard, uh, we've heard, uh, I thank the member for the question. We've heard evidence on these benches and indeed on the benches uh, opposite of the way in which police officers are, are treated, uh, not properly uh, supported, the police service not properly funded, all as a result of the UK Government's uh, austerity programme. It shows that when it comes to policing, the Tories will sell our police officers short. Yeah, yeah. Question, Pimp, si question five, Simon Thomas. Thank you. So, with what steps is the Welsh Government taking in relation to safeguarding children in Mid and West Wales? Public bodies give safeguarding of children the highest priority. And, of course, that is key to the Act, which is the Social Services and Wellbeing Act. Thank you for that response. Under that law, the Minister today had to issue a warning, a statutory warning, uh, following a Social Services inspection of the Children's Services in Powys. Uh, that uh, report published at midday today makes very disturbing reading. If I can just quote uh, a key paragraph for me. There was a lack of assessment in child protection cases, a lack of a sexual exploitation risk assessment, framework assessment and review, contrary to statutory guidance, an absence of care and wellbeing assessment and a lack of management oversight of these cases. And it then concludes this uh, lack of assessment is placing children at considerable risk, considerable risk. Um, your Minister has given uh, Powys uh, local authority 20 days to come up with an intervention, uh, an improvement plan, and there are in external uh, people in place, I understand, to help them to do that. But what assurances can you give uh, to me and the people I represent that in those 20 days that this considerable risk will be removed and that children and young people in Powys will be properly looked after and what are you doing as a government to ensure something else that's in this report that is extremely disturbing to me, which is the lack of political commitment to children's services in Powys? Well, these are matters primarily for Powys Council. There is a role for ministers, of course, which I'll, which I'll come to. Uh, but it does show that there has been a, a, a lack of leadership uh, in Powys. Uh, and it shows, I don't agree with what he said uh, and what the report has said in terms of there not being a political commitment to children's services. What then is the role of government? We've issued the warning notice. It is an unprecedented step. It provides the rigour and impetus to ensure that Powys delivers the improvements that, it, that are needed to its services. CSSIW will be monitoring, as will meet we, very, very uh, closely. But let me be clear, if we don't see prompt and sustained improvements, we will be minded to consider increased intervention, which may well include taking over the authorities' social services functions. Joyce Watson. Uh, and uh, I too am appalled uh, to read this report today. And it all really does come down to lack of leadership, uh, leadership in management 
and it, it's clear that it's uh, political leadership that's been lacking. And um, we all know that children are very often the most vulnerable within our society, and they do deserve at least a minimum commitment to them in the delivery of the services, as do the staff. There are staff working in this field in Powys today um, who are trying their very, very best to do a good job, and yet they're being completely undermined, according to this report, uh, by the lack of investment in them and in those services they're trying to deliver. So my question uh, to you, uh, First Minister, is um, whether you will support the call for Powys councillors to finally get their act together, to stop talking and to act collectively to, for the good uh, and well-being of the children. And also, uh, within uh, the next question following through, if it is the case that the council cannot prove uh, that they are taking the appropriate action in the given time scale that has been uh, put to them uh, by the Minister, uh, will it be the case that the uh, Government will move in and, and direct those services to deliver for the most vulnerable within Powys? Well, ultimately, of course, it is open to us as a Government to uh, take over the Authority's social services functions. That is, of course, an option if the Authority fails to deliver under the terms of the warning uh, notice. Uh, and that is something certainly that we will be monitoring closely over the next few days. I can give members the assurance uh, that this will receive the fullest attention of both Welsh Government and CSSIW, and no option uh, is ruled out if compliance is not achieved. Paul Davis. Uh, yeah. uh, Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, you will be aware of the sad case of Seren Bernard in my constituency who committed suicide in 2012 whilst under the social services of Pembrokeshire County Council. I saw her mother some weeks ago to discuss a report of Pembrokeshire Council into this report, and this report isn't to be published for legal reasons. It is important that issues such as this are dealt with in an open and transparent manner so that lessons can be learned by local authorities. So following on from Simon Thomas's questions, what specific guidance will you as government publish to local authorities in cases such as this to ensure that lessons are learnt in order to safeguard more children in the future? Well, I would encourage the authority to consider publishing the report possibly by rejecting some parts or redacting some parts of the report because we always start from a position, position of wishing to publish and I understand that due to f legal reasons it's not always possible to publish everything but it's important that the authority doesn't say we will not publish anything for legal reasons so it's important that they reconsider to see what they can publish and then of course to reject whatever's problematic. Question six, Neil McAvoy. Will the First Minister outline what code of conduct applies to the Office of First Minister? The Ministerial Code. First Minister, you claimed in this chamber last year that lobbyists don't have access to government ministers. You had to go back on that when it turns out that they do. You claimed this year that Plaid Cymru ministers were somehow implicated in the Liz Vane land deal scandal when £39 million was lost. The sale was decided after Plaid had left government. Lastly, you gave an interview to the South Wales Echo about local development plans. Then you claimed that you never make comments on LDPs or planning applications. And the reason why the story appeared in the paper in that way was because I put it there and phrased it that way. That's a really serious allegation to question a journalist's integrity like that, and I have no influence whatsoever over the South Wales Echo. You need to be held to account and be properly investigated. So since you won't answer me in any other way, I'm asking you now, in front of the people of Wales, will you vol voluntarily refer yourself to be investigated under the Ministerial Code of Conduct like Alex Salmon did in 2012, do you have the courage to do that? Mm. Let me see now. Let us just examine his, his position as a politician. He's not done well in making allegations, wild allegations in the past in the courts. 
Uh, he has found himself in a position where he's disciplined by the, uh, by the Ombudsman, if I remember rightly, in terms of his conduct as a councillor, and he's been expelled from his own party group. Can I suggest he has a long, hard look at himself first before criticising anyone else? Question, safe. Hannah Question 7, Hannah Blythe. First Minister, make a statement on Welsh Government support for Pride events in Wales. Yes, we've provided funding to Pride Cymru for many... Pride Cymru, I should say. For many years, including this year, despite budget, no one should read anything into that, of course, despite budget pressures. And Pride events provide opportunities for LGBT people and others to have safe, accessible spaces to celebrate. Thank you, First Minister. I welcome Welsh Government support for Pride Cymru, um, and hopefully, we'll see this event going from strength to strength and, and one day in the not too distant future host Euro Pride here in the capital. Uh, Pride events across Wales, of course, offer, offer, offer an opportunity for the LGBT community, our friends and allies, to come together in celebration in a space that is it's, it's safe for us to be ourselves. But while we must not be complacent, um, Pride enables us uh, an opportunity to demonstrate support and solidarity for LGBT people, and particularly young LGBT people. That's why I'm pleased this year that in my own constituency, we hosted the first ever Flincher Pride, and I'm incredibly proud to now to say that the um, Flincher Pride has recently gained charitable status, and I'm very proud that they've asked me to be a patron. Actually, alongside Andy Bell of Erasure fame, so I hope at Pride next year they don't mix up who is speaking and who's meant to be singing. Um, but, First Minister, will you join me in congratulating Flincher Pride on achieving this charitable status? And, of course, it would be fantastic if we were able to come and join us on June the 9th next year as we celebrate diversity and send a message of hope in our communities. Well, can I thank the member for the invitation, which, of course, I, I'll consider. I can say that the government hosted a stall at Flincher Pride in May. Uh, it was encouraging to see such a positive, uh, well-attended and successful uh, event. People travel from uh, far and wide, actually, to, uh, to go there, I understand. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, we want to make sure that uh, we continue to uh, support uh, Pride events in order to, uh, to celebrate and to fight those who encourage division in our society. Nick Ramsey. <clears throat> uh, first Minister, I was delighted to take part in the first Pride march in Cardiff a couple of years ago. I wasn't coming out, by the way. Uh, I was representing my party. Uh, it was great, a great event, as is the Pride uh, movement itself. Uh, following from what um, Hannah Blythen said, these events, I welcome Flincher Pride, but these events do tend to be associated, or have been in the past, uh, with cities and uh, urban areas, which is great as far as it goes. But will the Welsh Government look at ways of increasing the diversity uh, relevance of Pride uh, across all parts of Wales, uh, particularly rural areas, uh, so that people from all across the country can benefit from the spirit of Pride and uh, the, the freedom that it brings? Yeah, the Member's right. It has tended to be urban-based, uh, uh, and the Minister, I'm sure, will want to work with uh, organisations such as Pride Cymru to see how it's uh, possible to, uh, to increase the number of events, particularly in rural areas. Uh, and that, I'm sure, uh, working with, uh, with the organisation can be, can be achieved in time. Adam Price. Over the past few days, the Iris Film Festival has been staged here in Cardiff. It represents the largest gay film prize in the world and the largest short prize awarded anywhere. So may I ask the First Minister to congratulate those people who arranged that event and the volunteers for their success. I declare an interest because I was there for most of the festival and it is being staged by a friend of mine. But can I ask you what more we can do to help the Iris Festival to extend its message of pride across Wales, as we heard earlier, and particularly in thinking of Welsh speakers, where there is some work to be done, I think, in bringing together this question of pride in one's sexuality and one pride in one's language and culture. Well, it was a pleasure to hear of that success, and we wish to ensure that we work with the organisers to see how we can enhance the event itself and the influence of that festival and how we can grow. And so we'd be very happy to receive any kind of correspondence to see how we can help to build on the ideas contained in that correspondence. 
Janet Trenum Passmo. Uh, will the First Minister make a statement on the progress of the Ministerial Task Force for the South Wales Valleys? The uh, Task Force uh, published Our Valleys, Our Future in July, identifying three themes good quality jobs and the skills to do them, better public services, and my community. Following further discussions with communities, local authorities, businesses, and delivery partners, a detailed delivery plan will be published on the 7th of November. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Congratulate the Minister for Lifelong Learning and Welsh Language, Alan Davis AM, for his enthusiastic and energetic way within which he has launched his Ministerial Valleys Task Force. The Task Force has stated it will also explore the concept of a Valleys Landscape Park to help local communities build on many natural assets, including the potential for community energy generation and tourism. Will the First Minister outline the potential the Welsh Government sees in assisting the communities of Isloin in ensuring Cumcarn Forest Scenic Drive is enjoyed by as many people as possible? And can I also personally invite the First Minister to accompany me to visit the Cumcarn Forest Drive and enjoy one of the many of Wales. I, I have been actually to the Forest Drive um, when I, in my previous guise as, as a minister some years ago now. And of course, there was a long period of closure, as we know, which was very difficult for the uh, for the local community. It's a wonderful asset uh, for for her constituency uh, and one which attracts many many visitors. The minister and I have discussed the landscape park, and uh, we're, we're looking at ways of how we might be able to take that uh, forward. It's a good idea. Uh, it's a question of seeing how we can flesh out that idea to provide benefit not just for her constituency but uh, for all of uh, the communities that uh, that sit along the northern valleys. Okay. Question now, Mike Hedges. Mike Hedges. Will the first minister <coughs> make a statement on providing sufficient quality housing in Wales? Yes. One of the changes that, that uh, I've been most proud of over the past 20 years is that the standard of public housing now is as good as, if not better, than some private houses. Uh, there was a time, of course, when council houses could be distinguished by the fact that they were often built to a lower standard uh, than anywhere else, and that is something we can be proud of. Uh, the Welsh quality housing standard, of course, uh, Welsh housing quality standard, rather, uh, is hugely important in terms of securing improvements to existing homes, uh, and of course, together with the building regulations, they help us to deliver uh, better, uh, affordable homes for people for the future. Can I thank the First Minister for that res response? Uh, of course, uh, <coughs> council houses were built to a very high standard until the Conservative did away with the Parker Morris standard. Oh, uh, can, can I say some of the more enlightened tenants and councils in Wales supported council housing stock staying in council hands? What support will the Welsh Government give councils such as Swansea that have started to build council houses once again? Well, uh, he and I have been on site, of course, at, uh, uh, at uh, sites in Swansea where council homes are being uh, built. Uh, local housing authorities were invited to submit bids for funding support under the new Innovative Housing Programme, which promotes innovation in uh, housing construction techniques, design and uh, delivery. Uh, and, of course, money is being made available through the Affordable Housing uh, Grant. But I very much congratulate uh, Swansea Council on the uh, leadership they have shown in building council houses once again. I can all question Dig. Finally, question 10, Sean Gwentlian. Will the First Minister make a statement on the future of vascular services at Spetsi Gwynedd? Spetsi Cadwaladr University Health Board has approved plans to create a specialist vascular unit for North Wales at Spetsi Glanclwyd. There are no plans to close any other vascular departments. The Health Board will continue to treat patients with non-complex needs at all three North Wales hospitals. Given that the Health Board is in special measures... The final word on one of the crucial services of Aspetic Gwynedd sits with your government. The intention is to move the emergency vascular service away from Bangor. So if there were to be an accident in Aberdaron and that someone needed urgent attention because of serious bleeding, then that person would have to travel 72 miles, an hour and three quarters, in order to be treated. The Health Board intends to spend over £2 million on a new theatre in order to create a single new vascular unit. Is that good value for money when we have two vascular units among the best in Britain already in Bangor and Wrexham? Will your government intervene and ensure that common sense prevails so that there is the top quality service available to people in all parts of North Wales? There was a review of this, if I remember rightly, and one of the things that that uh, came up with was that we needed one specialist unit. We've argued about these issues 
previously in the Assembly where people have opposed moving one specialist service from one hospital to another. But what the outcome is that the services are better, and we saw that with the correctional surgery from Bronglice to Cardiff and the outcomes were improved because of that move. I know it's something that won't receive the support of everybody, but we have to ensure that the people of North Wales have the same access to a specialist unit as everybody else. 80% of patients will still receive their treatment in Spatigwyneth, but with the more complex cases, um, they will receive the treatment in a specialist hospital in order to get better outcomes. Thank you, First Minister. The next item is the business.